Well, good morning. My name is uh, Shibu Jos. I serve as the Associate Dean for Research in the College of um, Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources here at the University of Missouri, Columbia. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Dean of our college, Dr. Chris Daubert, it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the 12th Annual Agroforestry Symposium, Community Health and Resilient Food Systems. Dr. Sarah Lovell, Director of the Center for Agroforestry and her team have put together an excellent virtual symposium spanning over three days. I'm glad you are here attending the session today. Center for Agroforestry is one of our seven programs of distinction in the college. These are programs with a storied history and a global reputation. Collectively, the seven programs have brought in over half a billion dollars. Yes, you heard me right, half a billion dollars in funding over the past 15 years. As some of you know, and as Hannah mentioned, I do have a history with the Center for Agroforestry. I started off my career at the University of Missouri about 12 years ago as the director of the center. And we kicked off the first symposium in January of 2010. I'm so glad that the center has continued the tradition, even in the middle of the pandemic, without any interruption. Well, agroforestry is so close to my heart. I grew up on an agroforestry home garden in India. My grandma would claim she planted every tree and every crop on that farm, and that was true. She only had a fourth grade education, but her knowledge on how to put different functional groups of plants together to maximize the synergistic interactions was phenomenal. And I will give you a story. One day I brought a seedling of sandalwood. I hope many of you know what a sandalwood tree is. It's called liquid gold. It's highly valuable, the oil extracted from sandalwood. So I brought a seedling from school. It was such a precious tree, I knew that. I wanted to plant it in the middle of the front yard a small area that was devoid of any, any vegetation. That was the only area on our home garden that had no plants. Well, grandma wouldn't let me do it. She said the tiny plant needed a mom to take care of it. Yes, a mother to take care of it. I argued with grandma and said, no, it's a plant. It wouldn't need a mom. Well, I was in fifth grade and I even told grandma that I was at least a grade above her in terms of education. Well, you can guess who won in the end. Grandma won in the end. We planted the sandalwood near another tree, a larger tree, the mother to nurse the young seedling. It was nearly 10 years later when I was a student of forestry, I learned that sandalwood is a hemi root parasite and would need the help of other larger trees for its best growth. It put its roots through the roots of other trees and that's how it maximizes its water and nutrient uptake. Well, 
grandma didn't know the science behind it, but the traditional knowledge passed on to her from generations to generations, taught her that it needed a mom. How remarkable. As many of you know, I spent a career researching plant plant interactions. And I would still call my grandma the best agroforester of her time, who taught me a lot. Well, why did I bring up the story of the home garden? Almost every fruit and nut we ate came from my grandma's tiny home garden. A third of an acre in a suburb of a city that currently has 2 million plus people. And it was 12 miles from the city center. Seasonally, we ate mangoes, papayas, bananas, tamarind, and jackfruit. All came from the home garden. We ate cashew nuts and a local nut that looked like almonds. All came from the home garden, agroforest. We grew fresh vegetables and plenty of it so that we rarely had to buy them from a grocery store. We shared everything with our neighbors. If we didn't have something, perhaps our neighbor had it. The home garden I grew up is still there, but they are fast disappearing from the landscape as the city has outgrown the suburb. The land is so precious now. I calculated the value of the land in that area in US dollars this morning. And even I was surprised. It's about $1.5 to $2 million per acre. Yes, you heard me right. Almost $2 million per acre. And you cannot buy it in acres anymore. These are tiny housing plots now, sold in square foot. This is a place where a college professor may make about $4,000 per month. So now you get how valuable land is. So you cannot blame people for selling their home garden agroforest for apartments and, and condominiums. And that's when we see an opposite trend in our communities here in the US. Vacant lots are becoming food forests or urban agricultural plots. Subdivisions are establishing perennial landscapes with fruit trees and nut trees. These landscapes are providing food for the local communities. I'm so glad to see these creative solutions being applied in our rural as well as urban areas all across the country. My grandma would be so proud. While we take great pride in being one of the richest countries in the world, as we all know, we still face major challenges when it comes to health and nutrition. In our low income communities, in particular, both in urban and rural neighborhoods, they have little access to healthy foods, such as fruits and veggies that they can afford. According to CDC, 88 billion people in our country, that's more than one in three, have pre-diabetes. And eight out of 10 don't even know they have it. Eating a healthy diet, along with getting enough physical activity and sleep, is the key to having healthy people and a healthy community. Again, according to CDC, fewer than one in 10 US adults and adolescents eat enough fruits and vegetables. So how can we make healthy food, nutritious food available locally 
and make it affordable. The pandemic showed us how vulnerable our food production, processing, and distribution system is. We experience this at a smaller scale when we have extreme weather events, floods and droughts particularly. The theme of this year's symposium is community health and resilient food systems. Well, I have seen the connection between the two as a child growing up on my grandma's home garden. My grandpa and grandma lived a long life, a healthy life, well into their early 90s. We often joked about the secret of their health, the fruits and vegetables they ate from their home garden, and the physical labor they put into it. Well, now I realize it was not a joke. The mangoes from the mango tree didn't have to travel thousands of miles before we ate them. If it's not mangoes, we had bananas or papayas. The, universe, the diversity of the trees and plants ensured a continuous supply of healthy fruits and vegetables year round. Building more resilient local food systems will ensure a continuous supply of safe, nutritious, and accessible food for all members of a community. The Center for Agroforestry has been at the forefront of promoting specialty crops for such resilient food systems. Well, I know there are more knowledgeable speakers like the directors of the Philadelphia Orchard Project, Al Kibulan Marcus and Michael Mulebauer to share their experience on this topic. So let me conclude. Our college is all about innovative solutions in agriculture, food, and natural resources. We are a research leader on our campus. And we are proud of the accomplishments of our faculty, staff, students, and our collaborators, including the work done by the Center for Agroforestry, its faculty, staff, students, and collaborators. We just launched a new center called the Center for Regenerative Agriculture. I'm glad you are taking or you're talking about resilient food systems and community health as the theme of this year's symposium. I wish you the very best for a productive symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Droz. That was such a wonderful story that I think really outlines this connection between human health and land health so nicely. So thank you again so much. We would all be hearing applause right now. Um, if we were all together in person. So on the second day of the Agroforestry Symposium programming, I am really delighted to introduce our speakers, Alki Bulan Marcus and Michael Muehlbauer, um, who, as Dr. Joe said, are the orchard directors at the Philadelphia Orchard Project. As, as Dr. Joe's described, temperate agroforestry, um, it, it includes urban agroforestry, but has traditionally included five recognized practices, which are silvopasture, alley cropping, forest farming, riparian and upland forest buffers, and windbreaks. And um, of course, as was also highlighted in yesterday's sessions, indigenous peoples have been applying agroforestry on this landscape for millennia, including systems that are very similar to what we see now in urban settings, these food forests or forest gardens. These spaces have an important role to play for urban ecosystems and urban communities. The Philadelphia Orchard Project works with community-based groups and volunteers to plan and plant orchards filled with useful and edible plants in formerly vacant lots, community gardens, schoolyards, and other spaces, primarily in low wealth neighborhoods where people have limited access to fresh fruit otherwise. Michael Muehlbauer was hired as the Philadelphia Orchard Project's orchard director in January of 2018. And in addition to working with POP, Michael currently farms with youth in Germantown and is the operations manager and horticulturalist for Grumblethorpe. 
Histor Grumblethorpe Historic House and Gardens, having built their programs and gardens up over the last five years. He is also the founder of Sustainaculture Consulting and Design, former co-owner of the Sustainable and Edible Landscaping Company, Contemporary Homestead LLC, and former core member of the Beacon Food Forest in Seattle, Washington. Michael enjoys the practice of social farming and aims to bring community-powered food forestry to public land in Philadelphia with the Fair Amount Food Forest. Michael began farming with F.H. King students for sustainable agriculture in 2009 and worked as a research farmer in organic and no-till agriculture experiments for two years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he received a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture and Biological Systems Engineering. Aki Bulan Marcus was hired as the Philadelphia Orchard Project's Orchard Director in January 2020. Aki Bulan first got involved with food justice and urban farming in 2016 and previously served as the Orchard Project's Orchard Apprentice in 2016 and Orchard Assistant in 2018 and 2019. He's presented at the Black Urban Growers Conference on biochar and indigenous microorganisms. And Akubalan was the farm director of Mill Creek Urban Farm from 2017 to 2019, which is in West Philadelphia where he's from and where he provided the um, 19131 and 19139 community with locally grown produce and education. He's also a husband and a father of two. So thank you both for, um, for being here and I welcome you at this point to share your screens and um, hopefully we'll, we'll work out the technology and everything will go smoothly. All right, so again, I'm Aki Balan Marquis, um, the orchard, one of the orchard directors for the Philadelphia Orchard Project. Michael Mielbauer, also an orchard director for the Philadelphia Orchard Project. Um, we, this is the outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to start with some definitions, get into the Philadelphia landscape, um, broad strokes about the benefits of urban ag, urban orchards, and food forests, um, talk about our role within that work as Philadelphia Orchard Project, um, food justice in Philadelphia, broaden it out to uh, a slightly bigger picture, and uh, hopefully leave some time for questions at the end. I did want to disclaim that, uh, you know, I don't think we're thought leaders in this work, but, you know, we, uh, you know, our work is agroforestry in community in Philadelphia and food justice is very much a part of that. So to, um, just to start with a few definitions, um, I think it's helpful to explore a few different topics that interrelate with each other um, and, you know, just starting with justice, I found it personally helpful um, to break it down a little more, and maybe some of you will as well. But to look at a few different types of justice, you can look at it as a, a procedural justice, determining how fairly people are treated. Um, an example of that would be how Black people are treated by the police would be a procedural injustice. Uh, retributive justice is based on punishment for wrongdoing. And an example of retributive injustice would be the rates of incarceration and murder by police of Black people. Um, you know, we have a uh, restorative justice as well. Um, I guess my own personal definition for this is to restore relationships, AKA heal. Um, you know, you wanna seek to repair what is broken, compensate victims, Reconcile, reconcile relationships. Uh, an example of this will be the Justice Bill, um, Justice for Black Farmers Act, we will transfer 32 million acres to black farmers. Um, just a few examples, in 1920, black farmers owned 925,000 acres. And in 2017, that was reduced to 35,000. Um, and I guess through this act, it will be to protect the remaining black farmers from losing their land, provide land grants to create a new generation of black farmers like myself, and restore the land base that has been lost. Um, you know, again, we want to reinforce some of the reasons why uh, black farmers have been systematically denied access to land, subsidy loans, and other critical tools through government and private discrimi discrimination. Um, and I'll also say, you know, a lot of these tools and tricks were used to deceive indigenous populations in their land as well. Um, we want to move into distributive justice, you know, who gets what and who decides. Um, it's something that I always pose. 
An example is attempting to jointly define a vision of what distributive justice looks like for everyone, including the ecosystem, natural resources, including all voices, people, animals, and perspectives. Um, we're gonna move into racial justice next. The systematic fair treatment of people of all races resulted in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all in all areas of life. Um, racial justice goes beyond anti-racism. It is not just the absence of the discrimination and inequalities, including deliberate systems and supports to achieve sustained equity through proactive and preventative measures. Um, this goal goes beyond justice for the people, it's injustice for the planet as well. Um, when we fight our wars, we just don't destroy our homes. You know, white supremacy and patriarchy infects all areas of that activity. Um, and when we talk about racial justice, I do want to, you know, express that, you know, when I say racial justice, I mean black liberation. You start with the bottom up. Um, you help the weakest people and everybody else will be strong. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, operation, operationalizing racial justice is more about, you know, practices and um, that you can you can put into place to achieve racial justice, which can be, you know, begin with understanding the history of racism and white supremacy um, in, in order to be even able to start to address them. Um, working towards right relationship and accountability, uh, implementing interve interventions for problematic behavior, um, disrupting the status quo, using intersectional analysis can be a useful tool and centering blackness, indigenous and other people of color um, and, and looking to uh, create tools of empowerment versus just uh, service. So we're moving to sovereignty, sovereignty in the full right and power of a governing body over itself without interference from an outside source or, or bodies. Um, I'll also say sovereignty means like, you know, you're respected as a full capable human being. Um, and we're being, we're being referring to the, your own self-alliance as well. Um, so then we get into the idea of food sovereignty, um, which is basically talking about a food system in which the people that produce, distribute, and consume the food um, control, also control the policies, the mechanisms um, of food production and distribution, you know, as opposed to corporate and market entities controlling a, a global food system. All right, so food justice is community exercising their right to grow, sell, eat healthy food that is fresh, nutritionist, affordable, culturally appropriate, and grown locally with the care of the well-being of the land, workers, animals, addressing structural barriers to that right, which also lead to unequal health outcomes. You know, it does have roots in environmental movement, and uh, so, yeah, food justice draws in part on the environmental justice movement, which uh, partially was formed in response to the environmental movement's tendency to become more elite white and focused on wilderness and scenery rather than on communities um, that were most affected by environmental issues. So food justice, like environmental justice movement, is primarily led by BIPOC people that are most impacted by these issues. All right, so we're moving into the Philly landscape. Um, we are a little not Bay territory. You know, as you guys see, we are an industrialized city. So, you know, we have one of the biggest inner city parks, Fairmont Park here. A lot of our forests and rivers are actually paved over. Um, but I like talking about Philly as form of like, you know, we talk about climate change and everything. We're kind of like a natural disaster free zone. So like, we don't, really going to get hit by hurricanes or tornadoes. Um, it makes me think about safe zones around this country. Uh, black migration from the South, white violence, you know, black reconstruction pushback and local and state coups that happen. You know, we've seen the one in DC, but picture that during black reconstruction. Um, a lot of people were forced here um, off their land. There was a boom and decline of the manufacturing uh, industry. And remember the white flight. <laughs> um, there are some factors clearly evident in Philadelphia. You know, we were in the North, an industrialized city. The changing and failing infrastructure has opened opportunities for land development. Um, we do have vacant land abundance. We have um, programs like the land bank, you know, we've had its own issues. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
um, you know, soil building is needed. You know, in the city, usually they come in and scoop off the first layer of topsoil to build a home. Uh, we have a diverse working class, again, a majority black city. Um, you know, white flight of reverse and so gentrification is happening. And food access issues, um, COVID and just COVID exposed a lot of injustices. Um, like Mr. Um, Joseph said earlier, man, it was it was really super interesting hearing him say these things. Um, yeah, um, the multifaceted benefits of urban and ag. Um, we have uh, food production and distribution. You have some control over that. Um, few, we have a, a local cherry here. Um, I think that's a sour cherry. Um, we have youth and adult and educational opportunities. So here, you know, picture on the right is Phil Forsyth, one of our executive directors, TGB I believe how to prayer agent pear tree. Um, the picture on the left is kids foraging, I believe for berries. I think she has choke berries in her hands, I'm not sure. But usually with the youth and educational opportunities, man, like you open up a lot of avenues for these kids. Um, most of the time they're coming from, you know, inner city environments where like they're on a proposed to get the standard status quo jobs when they get older. A lot of these things to a lot of these kids to stay home. Um, and even adults will be able to do things for their children. Um, community and social connection. Uh, here we have um, our from Strawberry Fest, that Strawberry Mansion, one of our many orchards. Uh, they're picking strawberries, as you can see. Um, we have a partner here, Ficker Bakery. Usually they take Wolf We Grow through our gleaning program and cook things up with it. But they're having another event as well. I think that is Strawberry Fest. Um, the intergenerational exchange. Again, we talked about earlier, like, you know, we have Danielle here, the, um, the brother here on the right with his cousin. Um, they made it Sarah Island Homes, one of our, uh, one of our another one of orchards down by 41st in Paris. It's an elder home. So usually here, a gentleman like himself can plant an Asian pear tree again, for example, and feed a youth like this one on the left eating strawberries. The intergenerational exchange will help them feel connected, you know. Um, it keeps them whole in a way, because now when they look at things, they have memorials, real memorials, things like edible memorials in a way to connect these, these people. <clears throat> Uh, these gardens are a great place for youth engagement and development. Um, like Key was mentioning, um, we have a lot of inner city youth in a you know concrete jungle. Uh, many of our gardens have youth programs, extracurricular youth programs, a lot you know school visits. Um, you know people running through on their own, um, and a handful of these sites that we work with have uh, summer jobs for youth. Um, this happens to be another place that I work, Crumblethorpe, which was mentioned. And we have a three month summer job where youth learn horticultural skills, um, how to grow vegetables, fruit, um, how to run a market. They basically run it on their own. And um, yeah, yeah, it's just uh, an incredible opportunity and even more needed in, inside of a place like a city. There are economic opportunities opportunities like these markets. Um, you know, we, we're working with smaller sites, but it, it has been proven that you can make, you can make a decent amount of money on, a, you know, a small lot to a quarter acre. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's grown right there. It's, it's good for the local economy. Um, I got to touch a little bit more economic opportunities real quick, Mike. Um, sure. You know, we talk about making money, but I think it would also provide ease for families. So now they don't got to spend as much time at work and they can spend more time with their families. Remember, food and water is a basic need that we all need to keep going. So I think it also eases the economic burden. Um, this is a safe and healthy outdoor uh, activity. Um, you know, pre-COVID, very safe and healthy. But uh, also during COVID, uh, one of the only things we were allowed to do. Um, and, you know, this is important. We still need food. Um, and I know a lot of folks have, have told us that, you know, connecting with these spaces and these gardens in this time has been a respite, um, you know, while we go through all these things we're going through. Um, you know, there's environmental benefits. Um, 
you can talk about how, you know, perennial agriculture puts carbon in the ground, um, is a viable climate mitigation strategy, um, probably needs to be adopted on a much larger scale for that impact. But, um, you know, we also plant these food forests, uh, diverse understories with culinary, medicinal, uh, pollinator plants, many of those plants that are serving all those functions at the same time, um, you know, pr providing forage for bees um, and also, you know, helping to start to address some of our waste management issues, at least with the, uh, you know, organic matter, cycling it back into the landscape. Beautification. Um, again, we live in a harsh urban environment and these gardens can be very beautiful, um, you know, visually breaking up that, that abrasive, uh, you know, context that we're in. Um, and so, you know, you see a, a fruiting uh, peach right here and uh, an herb spiral labyrinth on the left. Um, yeah, it can really put you at ease just to, to spend a little time in these spaces. All right, green space and the mental health in the urban jungle. You know, um, you know, usually I'd say like when you're in a natural environment or farm environment or even an orchard, for example, or you walk down the city block and you see trees, it puts you at ease. You know, it's, it makes the environment less tense. You don't have no sunlight on your shoulders from the heat island or heat beneath your feet from the heat island effect. Um, it does repair the separation between the urban mind and like nature itself. Because here in the urban environment, you kind of feel separation from it. You know, you don't see no insects. You barely see any trees. Trees are being cut down. There's no soil being built around you. The air even changes quality when cars start driving. So, you know, most of our kids believe food is grown on. I don't even know if they know they're grown on trees, but there's a disconnect between food production and seasonal things as well. Um, empowerment, you know, it does build helps you build resilience and have control over your environment and food and also how you interact with plants. Um, you know, when you show kids that these things respond to daylight and water the same way they do, um, these things will, they grow weak, like they grow weak. Um, and it helps prepare, you know, particularly for African-Americans, it helps prepare the relationship with the soil and the trauma of the enslavement they endured. You know, it reminds them why they were brought here, you know? Um, you know, cause I've seen people here, they're scared of grass. You know, um, it's it's really interesting, um, but um, but yeah, you know, it will help people drop the pyramid of capitalism and help them engage within their roots um, and have faithful for themselves. You know, to be able to self govern. Um, so why urban agriculture? Um, you know, we look at this is Philadelphia and aerial view. We've seen a lot of folks, you know, moving into the cities, don't really know where the statistics are with that right now, but a lot of people do live in the inner urban environment and the surrounding areas. Um, and most of the land in this country is owned by, owned and controlled by white folks. Um, and the, uh, you know, the city is, is still a, a center of activity. Um, and so, you know, right nowadays, it's like general population, who, who remembers how to grow their own food? Who, who remembers how to yield from wild foods that are dropping in abundance all around us? And so the, the work in the city, I feel like, is an important both like focus and bridge um, to the natural environment, getting back into, yeah agroforestry and providing for yourselves. Um, what is Pot Roll? Pot partner with his Ixon community group to design, plant, and maintain the orchards, food forests in the city. We have 65 community orchards and counting, edible fruit nuts, trees, berry bushes, fruiting vines, and culinary, medicinal, and pollinator plants we, we, we help establish. We work with community partners and community to design, plant, and maintain these. Um, primarily in low in community with low abundance. Um, partner control their spaces and use and distribution, which is lively free to community. Um, we also provide ongoing support through hands-on coaching and uh, work days. You know, we do provide 
materials as well, online and in hand? Um, we have a, a gleaning program called Pop Harvest, where we organize um, harvest all over the city of, of lesser known fruits than the landscape. In the middle, we have uh, our, our typical June berry campaign, where we have a rash of harvest events all over the city. It's a, a commonly planted street tree, very delicious, and folks are walking right by it, not knowing that they can eat it. Um, we work with a, a bunch of other plants like mulberry, um, ginkgo. On the right here, we have trifoliate oranges. And we often, we, we started to pair these harvests with workshops on how to transform it into uh, useful, tasty concoctions. Um, and we hire outside <coughs> voices and teachers to... Uh, to come in and share their own knowledge on this. And so it's a good way to kind of get other perspectives. We have a, a school orchard program that works with a dozen schools um, and both hands-on and provides free lesson plans. And we also, as mentioned, provide other workshops um, and develop a, a variety of Printed and online materials. We uh, have a core workshop series in urban eco orchard care. Um, we have a weed ID guide that's available on our website. We have been producing pest and disease guides um, for tree fruit. That's available for free on our website. Um, I will be revisiting and redeveloping those um, and working on a bramble pest and disease guide um, we have an orchard care calendar. Um, we've created a community organizing toolkit of best practices and suggestions for folks um, to assist in community organizing. Um, we mentioned the lesson plans, plant ID signs, recipe cards in English and Spanish. Um, we hook it up with tools once a year uh, to all of our partners that fill out our survey. Um, we provide plants uh, on a sliding scale all the way to zero um, to our partners, um, provide seasonal tips through our email lists. We're also on call. Here on the left, you know, we have, we're usually working with volunteers. Um, we have our lead orchard volunteers or people who are pretty much community liaisons who will help manage these spaces. Uh, we've been revitalized how we're doing that program, but usually now we have people require coming with the team. But the lead orchard volunteers, you know, they do come in and they do learn through our popcorn and they learn how to manage the space and relay that information to the community. Um, we have Garrison here. He's, you know, former pop, I would call him either. He did an apprentice, um, from, you know, former pop apprentice, but he still helps out from time to time. Again, we have Strawberry Mansion. I think he's adding most to the Blackberries. Um, one, um, here we have the pop headquarters. Um, very excited about this. Uh, this was established in 2020 of last year. Um, it's on the Woodlands Historic Estate um, in the Woodlands Cemetery, essentially. Um, originally 300 acres owned by a wealthy man named William Hamilton. Uh, he inherited the land from lawyers and other powerful people. Um, I, it is Lenape territory. Um, the Learning Orchard for partner sites in public. So again, it's going to be like the central hub where we train people lead orchard volunteers or volunteers like here in the left, Bill, Sarah, and Taylor. Um, we got Phil in the back as well. Um, and we're going to, you know, use that as the incubators to be the hub. You know, this is one of Pop's first orchards that we can intensely manage ourselves and control what happened with the produce. Um, also, we moved our nursery here. The picture on the right, you see myself and my truck. Um, we moved our nursery from Aubrey Arborino, one of our many sites. Um, we've been using that for a very, very long time. Um, but it feels good to be able to have a place and now we have like complete access. You know, we had to travel across the city for this. Um, but this year, you know, um, as you guys can see in our plants, we have, we have a future high tunnels, a climate battery greenhouse. Um, this year, if you guys seen in the learning orchard itself, we've produced 1400 pounds of annual food production in 2020 to a local organization called Food Not Bombs. So they took inspired food from supermarkets or food that went past uh, the sell-by gate 
and the food that we would grow, we would give to them, and they'll distribute it locally in West Philly. Um, they have many chapters across the city, but we we mess with the West Philly chapters. Uh, we did seed saving with True Love Seeds. We grew okra, Landry string beans, um, and I think we tried to do a squash as well. But that that was interesting. We had to fight off a lot of squirrels. Um, pop perennial plants. Um, so usually, you know, when we plant orchards, you know, we do plant perennials. You know, we do talk about the seven layer uh, food forest. Um, partnership with pops can help lead to long term access alongside with um, other groups like neighborhood garden trusts, PHS, um, and developing leases and remembering the understanding. Um, we have a wide variety of plants here. Um, usually, a lot of our stone fruits do okay, not all the time. Um, um. So yeah, we were we work with a, a wide variety of of perennial fruit trees, nut trees. Um, we you know in our climate we have a lot of challenges with stone and palm fruits. So you know, plums, cherries, peaches, uh, nectarines, apricots are, are really difficult in this environment. Um, apples and pears are too. Um, and you know we work with small spaces, um, various types of partners with uh, little to uh, interest in spraying or little capacity for spraying. But um, we find, you know, for the people that we work with um, and in our environment in general, stutch, sour cherries um, tend to work pretty, pretty much better, the best. Um, European pears and Asian pears out of those. This is kind of a, a visual uh, representation of how easy or difficult it is uh, to grow various crops um, in our environment in Philadelphia. Um, figs, pawpaws, and persimmons are big winners. Very little pest and disease issues. Um, June berries and mulberries are good, but underutilized. We're starting to see uh, more rust on the June berries. Um, grapes are pretty challenging. <laughs> Um, but I, I think there's a lot of potential for nut production, especially hazelnuts in smaller places. Um, brambles and blueberries are fairly easy, but we're, we're having some challenges. I mentioned the, the pest and disease guide. We're working on um, other options for easy plants would be aronia and nankeen cherry, um, which may need some processing and education. But then we often, again, you know, plant these mixed culinary, medicinal, and pollinator um, understory plants together, which provide additional yield in the same space. All right, land and soil. So again, you know, uh, we, we talk a lot about planting food forts and everything, but usually the soil has the least advocacy. Um, again, we talked about most of the top soil have been removed from the planet. Um, you know, we, we we are, you know, we need to build soil, essentially. Soil is the foundation of food justice and food sovereignty. Remember, without soil, you know, we have dirt, and you can't plant anything in dirt. Dirt does not hold life. <laughs> um, you know, I, I usually try to put in the people's minds as above, so below. You know, we have the seven layer food forest and the seven layers of soil beneath. You know, we have to restore the intelligent web of microorganisms, mycorrhizae, um, and how these things can communicate. Um, and build fertile soil to hold life. Um, Land is power, and it is the foundation of power. It helps the people actually stand on their feet. Um, you know, you can't settle roots and disturb soil. Um, and usually, mostly with most of our pop sites, um, we do usually go out and provide people with resources to get a soil sample. We usually send ours to the University of Massachusetts uh, to give you the basics, um, foundation for calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium, you know, the base, to, the big six and um, other trace macro minerals and things of that nature. Um, so we have food justice in Philadelphia. Um, here on the left, we have soil generation. They're mostly a black and brown collective um, of farmers and organizers and, you know, advocate workers who want to help, you know, food access and soil regeneration in Philly. Uh, Neighbor Garden Trust, they helped community gardeners to clear their land pretty much um, through leases. Um, we also have, I guess this is, before I go too far into our partner sites, I want to acknowledge other groups as well. Uh, SWAG, Southwest West Agriculture Group, which is a coalition of farms between West Philly and Southwest Philly. 
um, Philadelphia Park and Rec, Farm Philly, PHS, and uh, Nisog. Um, again, this is one of our pop partners, Mill Creek Urban Farm. Um, this farm is, uh, is half the city block. Um, we talked about earlier that rivers and creeks flow underneath our city, and the river and creek flows right underneath Mill Creek. Uh, it's a sewer line now, but they couldn't support the foundation and the houses collapsed. Um, so here on the left, we have some some youth that picked some aging pears. You know, they local kids that came through, and you know, I gave them some. They were consistent with coming through for like two weeks. You know, they came through perfectly when the fruit was ripe. Um, but on this farm, we had two pear trees, apples, peaches, and pears, um, blackberries, raspberries, and strawberries, two fig trees, beehives, uh, gray water systems, everything. It was meant to be a production farm. Um, and what I would say about my experience there was that literally, like, you know, when you run in your marketing seed, you run into, like, weird pest and disease problem in your annual production, and you look up and you see aging pears. And now you can bring them to the market. Now you can share a treat with the community. Um, yeah, that was, that was a really humbling feeling, you know, it was very delightful that I was able to bring these things to market. Um, and it does bring up like residual and perennial foods, um, the promise or security of hard work, small and light work. Um, here we have FNC Poplar, um, at located at 8th and Poplar. Um, this is Marta here on the right. Uh, she's, I'll say she's the farm director. Um, usually, you know, what they do with the produce here is that they sell it through their market. Um, they have it lowly locally right there on the corner outside the gate. Uh, we have Phil Forsyth here on the left. He's also noticing the Asian pear tree. Um, I think he may be pointing out fire, but like, that's usually the time of year that happens. Um, but inside this place, they have a community garden, um, Vietnamese gardeners, people of all different cultures and walks of life. And here, here's Bartram. Um, we have Chris from Sankofa Farms here on the right. So Bartram Garden holds a, a big orchard as well that we help maintain in conjunction with Sankofa. And Sankofa have youth like they do here on the left. Um, usually these kids come through high school programs and they teach them about, you know, the African diaspora, um, their connection to the plants, how to cook the food, how to grow it and whatnot. And through the older kids, they bring in younger kids and train them. And then they kind of do like this incubation program. So we talked about the lead orchard volunteer program before. Um, and now we want to try to get youth to become lead orchard volunteers. So when they even graduate from these programs, they will still be plugged into the community and we can start creating these loops that we need to do. Cause we got to get these youth to understand you can't really be speaking in linear equations anymore. Things don't work like that. Um, uh, I just want to reiterate that, um, yeah, we, we were always partnered um, and, and our work is to support the work of our partners in, in the communities that they work with, um, you know, 65 partner sites all across the city at this point. There are many other organizations in Philadelphia working on this uh, sort of food justice, um, food access work. Um, I'm excited to be a part of a group that's about nine months pregnant with a public food forest for Fairmount Park to be community run and educational. Um, and there's just a, a multitude of other organizations in Philadelphia and a robust community gardening scene. But um, to back it up, uh, this is happening in almost every major city. Uh, if you look at what's happening in the United States, um, you know, it's not just us. We, we got Soulfire Soul Farm up in New York doing amazing work outside of New York. Um, a lot happening in the Bay Area, which has been going on for a long time. Um, you know, migrant workers are, you know, fighting for their rights um, and, and to be not exploited. Uh, there, there's national coalitions of all kinds. Um, corn, corn growers have been fighting to be able to save their own seed um, and not lose their farms due to genetic contamination. Uh, Midwest dairy farmers have been fighting for fair prices against, you know, trade agreements, which basically make them have to spend two dollars for every dollar fifty they make um, in milk production, and so. Yeah, this is a larger systemic issue. And, um, you know, food justice means a lot of different things to different people and food sovereignty. 
Um, you know, I do want to touch on a few things. Well, California drought, you know, and the water restrictions that's going to be happening soon because, you know, resources might become scarce. Um, you know, when you watch your land dry up, you know, that did lead to a lot of farming to commit suicide. Like, it was interesting. But um, the average age of farmers is 65. I don't know if that's still a thing, but that's what I was hearing when I ran a Mill Creek. Um, and I, I hope that it goes down in the near future. Um, you know, we want to bring up much more. You know, we talk about the Victory Gardens, which, which came out during like World War II in 1943. Uh, it produced at that time, you know, 40% of the country's fresh vegetables. So like, you know, we're saying like front yards, basketball courts, baseball diamonds. Uh, some people said like, I heard things from um, Nate, you know, one of our board members, he runs Experimental Farm Network. He was seeing people use like airplane fields and strips to grow food. Like it was, it was really just, you know, the mindset change. Um, and it kind of moves into like, you know, the cooperative gardens, you know, um, thing that's being built here, I think across the, you know, the country in different states. Um, you know, I do want to piggyback off of the Freedom Farm Collective Cooperative, which was an agricultural cooperative in Sunflower County, Mississippi, founded by Fannie Lou Hamer in 1969. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer was a political activist. She was big on voters' rights and everything, and also like using land as a as a power base to your political structure. Um, Freedom Farm Cooperatives sought to create the conditions of self-sufficiency for African-Americans that alleviated poverty and removed the economic insecurity that have been placed, placed upon us, you know? Um, and this is happening everywhere, all over the globe. Um, you know, it is a larger movement Transnational organizations have pressured globally to adopt GMO seeds um, and abandon old ways of farming and, you know, giving up control of your own food system. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, factors at play here, urbanization, the, the cost of land um, and such. But, you know, the, these forces exploit and compete for profit every step of the way possible from the land, water, the worker, the owner, the control of seed, price setting and distribution. And people are fighting this all over the world. Um, and there's coalitions to join. Uh, so just wanted to broaden it out, you know, but then bring it back into, um, you know, these systems produce an inferior quality food with uh, less nutrition and, and imports from far, far away that, that don't need to be like that. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks are fighting for local food, food security and sovereignty. Um, yeah, uh, well, this is a quick picture of me planting a fig tree with two local youth at Montessori High School. Uh, it's a grade school, Montessori grade school, you know, Island Avenue. Um, you know, also, I guess the, you know, how that back into the summary. Um, yeah, man, it's the only rock we got. Um, and we got to, you know, save the earth, essentially. Um, yeah, um, I guess you want to open it up for questions, Mike? Yeah, I mean, just to bring it back a little bit, is like best place to start is right where you are. Um, and to, yeah, remember kind of these other terms and, and the bigger picture when you're thinking about um, food justice. Yeah. But thanks. This is Mike and Key from POP. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you both so much. That was incredibly inspiring and so informative. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions rolling in, and I know there were some people that posted questions in the chat. I just want to remind you to put those in the Q&A box so that I don't miss any. Um, so there's a lot of other conversation, wonderful conversation happening in the chat box too. Um, so just to get started, there have been a few questions about how this project is funded. Um, you all are doing so much. How is it funded? How are you finding land? How does that work? Um, well, you know, it's a lot of grants and donations. Key and I um, don't interact with that as much as orchard directors. We have two co-executive directors um, with very mixed roles. We're, you know, a small nonprofit with a small staff and we do a lot. Uh, I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, as far as I know, it's, it's typically grants, grants. And, um, Sorry, 
And as far as land goes, we're always in partnership with another organization. So, you know, they the organizations apply to us, be like, we're interested in an orchard. We have a checklist of, you know, things you might want to think about. Um, and we're starting to, we used to require legal land access and because of what's going on in food justice, we're, we're opening it up to people that don't have legal access. Um, and Pop did just get its first own piece of land lease agreement to have our learning orchard on. So we'll finally have our own space to maintain more intensively ourselves and teach from um, nursery there, lots of, lots of opportunities. And, you know, I guess, you know, through the economic opportunities, hopefully Pop will be able to touch more on um, different ways you can utilize the produce. We have a nursery now, so we could become like the local distributor of local plants, breed, plant breeding and things of that nature. But um, I guess we can open up our own form of resilience now and mimic that model. But yeah, yeah, you know, as always directors, right? yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know much. Um, cool. Yeah, it seems like with as much as you're doing, there must be a pretty big team with the Philadelphia Orchard Project. How many people do you work with? Uh, uh, yeah, so we got Phil and Kim, me and Mike. Um, I think it's, it's what's the woman's name? We got Sharon coming on. Do you remember the, the newest education coordinator that we, we just hired recently? I don't I don't know names yet, but yeah, we just hired two folks. Um an education and outreach coordinator and an apprentice. Um, and then it's just the two of us and two executive co-executive directors. Wow. Well, I am totally impressed as I'm sure a lot of people are who are listening. Um, we had a question actually from one of our faculty at the University of Missouri. Um, he asking, he's asking, have you partnered with the increasing number of people working on conservation and biodiversity issues, including those working explicitly in the black community to assess and evaluate some of the broader outcomes of your work on vacant lands? Oh, um, I don't think, our, do our analysis even get that deep? Um, I mean, besides doing our, um, you know, usually our interviews with elite orchard volunteers, um, I, I don't know. That is. Give me a second. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Yeah, more. but I, I think the the short answer would be no. I don't think we've we've bridged that gap, but um, would love to talk to folks. Well, it's my understanding that Dr. Charlie Nylon, who asked that question, is doing that kind of work. So um, you might be able to connect with him in this. Simplicity. Yeah, please, please reach out. And anybody in this um, Zoom, our contact information should be available. If it's not, um, I'll find a way to get into Whova and. <coughs> Great. Um, we have a few questions too, asking about um, some specifics for the the tree crops that you work with. So, if you have any favorite um, tree tree fruits, if you're working with chestnuts, Chinese chestnuts at all. There you go, Mike. Um, I mean, again, like pawpaws, really easy. Um, figs are a favorite. And, you know, our favorites are the ones that yield a lot and don't need a lot of technical. Uh, support. So, you know, persimmons as well. Um, we have some chestnuts, I, I think mostly hybrid chestnuts, <clears throat> but I do think that there's a lot more work to be done with nuts. Um, I'd love to do that in the city and outside of the city and everywhere. So, so related to that question, um, the, the chart you showed of the, the ease of growing certain crops, is that available on your website? It is not, but I'm happy to make a PDF of that and, and share that out. Great. Yeah, it sounds like that would be helpful for some of the folks in the crowd. Um, uh, someone else is wondering if you have access to a community kitchen and if you teach food preservation. Partners do, um, like Ficker Bakery, um, Food in Our Bomb. So we, like through our gleaning program, we do partner with chefs and chefs do her workshops through our spaces. So. Pretty much for this year, um, pretty much for this year, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Hope maybe the COVID, post COVID, or limited gathering space or more workshops online, I guess. Um, but that's usually how we do it. And I know also we do our own recipes sometimes ourselves, um, through the things we do, I guess, pretty much at home. Um, you know, not really big for commercial or anything like that, but. <coughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of people in Philadelphia that would love access to a commercial kitchen. 
Um, a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, we, we have a few partners that we work with. Um, we also do outdoor workshops um, when and pay for um, food safety training for our guest teachers um, is, is another way to go about it, but um, definitely would help a lot. So there's someone here asking, there are a lot of connected questions, so I'm trying to group them together best I can. Um, but this person is from um, Milwaukee, it looks like, and is saying we have a lot of vacant lots where homes stood but could be home to orchards. How do you handle the possibility of soil contaminants and do you find them often on such sites? Um, well, I mean, with tree crops, um, we, we're not as worried about lead contamination. That's usually from actual soil contact. Um, and I believe there's studies out there about this. So tree crops and tree fruit, tree nuts, uh, much safer than like growing carrots or, or vegetables straight out of that ground, uh, which is why a lot of people grow and raise beds on land like that. So if you're doing annuals, herbaceous, stuff like that, that's like near the soil um, and eating stuff out, like that grows in the actual soil, not a great idea, but tree crops better. You know, that's something that came up in the conversation this morning in the Urban Agroforestry Roundtable too. Akimilan, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess it just comes back down to like the sewer remediation, you know, because like if you want to like say if you are planting tree crops and things like that, but you want to start doing alley cropping and things of that nature, um, to utilize the space until the trees get big enough. Um, I'm just thinking about methods of pulling lead out of the soil and good ways to remove it. Um, you know, because I, I work a lot with biochar and using a lot of our prunings, turning that into char. Um, to build our soil, but also like charcoal can pull lead and hold it in place. So could you grow in place as well while remediating it? I don't know. I have a lot of questions for myself when it comes to that. You know, I'm not the uh, expertise, expertise, but I'm learning now. I'm learning. Um, so I'm just theorizing. Could you can throw sunflowers there and sunflowers pull up toxins. But what you going to do with the sunflowers? You can't compost the sunflowers. You can't burn it, you know, because I think it will just carbonize the, the lead. Um, and, you know, um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, but it didn't go back to nut and tree crops. Um, some fruit crops don't even pull up a lot of heavy metals, you know, um, so yeah. There's definitely more on this topic that I think we could get into and there maybe there's a, a meetup that will be happening on, on soil contamination later on. Um, so related to that, have you worked on community-based composting efforts and are there any local concerns about that? And in parentheses here, animals or sharing of composted soil? A lot of people are composting. You know, we have a lot of community gardens. Um, I'm pretty sure there's like a pilot municipal program that um, the city is actually putting out there that is a community composting model. Um, but, it, you know, the site has to be right. Access needs to be right. We were considering it for one of the places I work, but it's just, you know, we have big fences that we don't open up all the time at, at one of my sites. So, um, yeah, but it is, uh, I think, you know, it is a really good idea. I would love to see municipalities, you know, do this like it happens on the West Coast and in Germany, you know, where it's just literally picked up from your house. Yeah, yeah, special green bins. Um, I guess, you know, well, Pop, I haven't really done that work just yet, but um, I guess uh, when I was at Mill Creek, you know, we had People Mercy Center, um, maybe the place that did food distribution of like, you know, again, not sellable produce, but still good enough for people to eat. Um, they used to drop off tons of their produce every Saturday, like every time they distribution day, Wednesday and Saturday. And I would take their scraps. But yeah, you, you need a place like the city's recycling center to really do something like that. Um, but the city's recycling center actually is pretty great. Um, you can, you can yeah, I'm not, I'm not. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, do they take kitchen scraps? So that's my question. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, see, 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 because like you can make the compost a lot better because they're just storing like no more brown material together with no no nitrogen. So, you know, ain't, ain't nothing in there. So I don't know. Yeah, it's, but no, it's pretty dope. It's it's an abundance of free compost that you can rebuild and recharge yourself. You know how. So that's where Pop comes in and we can teach you how to do that. Nice. Yeah, there are a few questions here on land access, and I know we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but um, questions about zoning, if there are any policy changes that you'd like to see to support land access or, or longer term leases? I mean, I don't 
I don't know. It's really tricky here in Philly. Um, you can get a one-year lease. Uh, I see a question about the land bank and how to use it. So the uh, expression of interest. So if it was a vacant lot and the land bank had it in their database, you put an expression of interest in. But I don't know if it's like one of those first one first serve. I don't really, I never engaged in it. Um, yeah, I I mean, I mean, people are having a lot of issues with the land bank. Uh, um, and so it's, it's not really so far providing people with long-term legal access. Even if you do get access, it could be pulled out from under you. Um, you know, we would love to see policies put in place that gets these, you know, lots into the hands of people that are going to use them for agriculture, not just the highest bidder later on after you built a garden. Um, so, you know, and that, that could look like, you know, opportunities for ownership and, and subsidizing some of the work. Yeah. Um, usually I just tell people to plant until somebody threatens to pull it up. And if they don't threaten, if they don't come pull it up, you just keep going. Um, yeah, but that's, you know, that's kind of, moving because like no one owns the land so this is very complicated to talk about you know um it's like spiritually that doesn't even make sense like i wasn't born i didn't i didn't i wasn't born with a piece of plot of earth in my hand i didn't come out the womb with it so i shouldn't even be having a jurisdiction or even have to begin to tell you guys how to acquire land when land should be free um but if it's spaces are open in the city generally people just jump on it and use it um i think the community determines what happens to it most of the time um, for an organization like ourselves, though, we don't have like, I mean, hopefully we do open up that door of more like security. Um, you know, uh, politicians, Congress people, some of them might be with you or not. If you live next to a, a partial, you can buy that for a dollar. But if you stay at that program where you can preserve a, a vacant lot, if you live next to it, it might be a little complicated now, but I don't think it'll be that difficult. Mm -hmm. But working with the Neighborhood Gardens Trust is, is uh, they, they, focus on trying to get that garden preserved for for long term yeah it works you know we'll see um, we might get people land one day okay yeah this is really interesting and um it sort of connects with one of these other questions that um about engaging with community and and how long you might want to have a connection with a group or with a plot of land to ensure that your efforts and planting will come to fruition Well, like I said, we, we kind of have like a, a checklist of, of what you should be thinking about water access, um, succession plan, even if your lead gardener has a life change. Um, you know, uh, they, there's a lot of different the whole design process as well. And so, you know, it can be competitive. We, we take one or two on a year um, and have quite a bit at this point. But I would say that, yeah, we're, we're looking for someone dedicated. Um, but we also know that there's risk. We will lose a garden here or there. Um, and, you know, that's part of the work. Every, not, everything's temporary. We're temporary. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think I'm just scrolling through to see what I'm missing here. Are there any plant ID apps someone is asking that you like to use or other plant cultivation apps maybe? I haven't found one that I like, but someone, I'm sure someone in the chat knows a better one than I would. Yeah, folks, feel free to <laughs> drop things in the chat. I'm kind of curious about that too. Looks like iNaturalist is popular. Yeah, that's the one that everybody been using. Huh. Um, another question, do you have problems with deer brows in your orchards? Uh, deers, yeah. In our learning orchard, we got hit with a, <laughs> yeah, we got hit hard by deers. Um, that was the only time I, I experienced them in the city. Um, maybe somehow by Whistle Hicken. Um, yeah, yeah, like uh, our, our ones in park spaces, um, definitely get deer browse if they don't have deer fence. Um, so it depends, you know, we're working in vacant lots, we're working in Fairmount Park, we're working on school yards. Um, so the majority of the urban, urban inside the city aren't gonna have any deer browse though. Um, our London Orchard, we just installed a deer fence down there. Um, yeah, we had a lot of deer damage. It was really interesting and they chewed a lot down. Um, they even ate through my okra. You know, okra has like an irritation to the flesh. 
So I don't even know how they were like it's just they bold, man, real bold. You know, and okra might be, you know, a little different, I guess. But uh yeah, man, I, that that disturbed me. I'm like, yo, y'all out here eating my okra leaves, man. Like that was a hurt one, that was a hurt piece. But no, you know, it just teaches you how to be in the space with other things, you know. Um, and these things happen, you know, like you said, setbacks happen, you know. Got a lot of bird problems, bird problems with the berries. Yeah, we have squirrels, you know, we have squirrels. Bad. We got like gangster yeah. squirrels. Um, yeah, we have some bold critters here in Missouri too. <laughs> Um, so related to animals, domesticated animals, are, have you been integrating any, this person is asking about small birds or animals such as chickens, guinea pigs, rabbits, or pigeons? Um, well, at the learning watch, we might try to do something like that. Um, duck, geese, maybe get a chicken coop. We don't know yet. It's all in the air right now. But in our other spaces, um, some spaces might have them. I think at Grumblethorpe. And we got chickens at Grumblethorpe. They're they're good for like June drops um, of the fruit and, and trying to get the bugs inside of the the June drops. Um, although I I actually usually collect up the June drops and feed them to them myself because they are terrible scratchers. They mess up all my mulch, and um, it's also kind of an ornamental garden farm, you know, orchard thing. So the chickens just make a huge mess. Um, I guess you guys want to count farm dogs and stray cats. They help a little bit too. Um, I seen some catch pigeons, but um, you put rain barrels strategically underneath your trees. Squirrels might fall into them. I seen that. That was real interesting. Oh, <laughs> uh, yo, it's crazy. They have seen like three times without managing milk tree. Um, they just fall right in. They slip on a branch and fall on a rain barrel. And they get big. Um, but go ahead. I guess next question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you if anyone has seen that before, it's interesting. Um, so this is some just sort of broader questions that I think you addressed to some extent in your presentation. But just thinking about the challenges and benefits that uh, you see in incorporating agroforestry or perennial tree crops into urban beyond annual production, urban agriculture. Yeah, I mean. Um you know, perennials are more permanent. These tree crops are give folks a sense of permanence um, and, you know, helps with the heat island effect and having a cool, relaxing place to be. Um, you know, I, I am focused primarily on uh, perennial production. And I think that, you know, with climate, issues and food security and all of these the intersection of everything we mentioned is, is why I'm interested in the work um, and there's definitely space for it in the city it, you know it was really inspiring to hear that story that was given before us um, and, and how this is not new at all yeah, yeah um, I guess for myself um, I think about like the indigenous population that lived here and in us we're understanding their ways, we can start depending on ourselves with localized food pyramids. Um, that's an really big one, man. Like importation, exportation, when it comes to perennials and annuals, um, just grow things that can grow a lot easier here. Um, grow what's easy to you. Yeah, yeah. I'm always in the air on different things. Yeah, we're gonna plant a hundred acres of nut trees and hopefully they just, you know, but we don't wanna do weird forms of monoculture, you know? Um, anyway, yeah, I have tons of ideas and all these questions are definitely making me think a lot more. So I appreciate them. Yeah. Well, so this kind of is connected to one of the, the questions that I wanted to save for last, because I think we could spend a little while on this, but I'm just curious about your big dreams and, uh, for your community and for the future in general. Um, it's for me just to use my privilege and position to gather more knowledge on how we can cultivate a greener reality here in a great environment. Um, and could we be like a, you know, a stepping stone in the right direction towards regenerating the planet, um, re-inoculating systems with ours, um, you know, um, and getting that, like, really, like, the human, the population, the food scale here is just really off, and we got to fix that, you know, we got to reconnect people, our homes should breathe, everywhere we walk should breathe, our homes should breathe, they should be comfortable, you know, they should be more sufficient, um, and creating orchards, and not even orchards, just, just seeing more life around us. Um, 
and really getting people more intertwined through land um, and around land, centering activity. So, you know, now we start understanding like how to help kids develop things right in front of them. And when you get things right in front of you, it helps you come up with solutions, you know? Um, Cause you're not used to using your hands or clearly thinking and you always have access to a quick thing or quick device or easy help, which isn't bad all the time, but it's just, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to put my vision in the, into perspective, but I guess for myself, man, like, I don't, I guess for organization wise, um, just establish some orchards, orchards, um, build up the, the learning orchard, become a prime example of what's possible across the city, you know, and I kind of where I'm at right now, you know, um, I guess, you know, also with pop as well. Like that's, I think that's really where we're at. And also how to really develop more of our lead orchard volunteers um, and really make that more like it's a, it's a good program now. But I think also just how to like least intimidate this work as much as possible for the average folk to make it easily digestible. You know, yeah. um, you want to make it a practice that's all the way into their lives. So besides saying I'm going to the orchard, you know, I'm, I'm coming home to one, too. You know, it can just be a simple Juneberry tree in front of your house. It can be a small bush a berry bush that's in a pot, you know, you can make compost in your backyard, restore your humus where you are, you know, like we said, work where you at, make pots, raise beds and things of that nature. So, you know, I think that's for us because like we can join all these symposiums and things like that. I could talk to a highbrow crowd, but if I go to average folks in the city, they don't know what agroforestry is. Um, like Mr. Joe said, like most people had fourth grade education, but they were able to build houses. They were able to attend agricultural field. They can go out there and make medicine. You know what I'm saying? So we got to be in a point where like we're more capable and we're more relying on ourselves besides superficial, you know, means um, and fake ideologies and fake deities. You know, um, you know, we have turned for these called politicians and things like that. So like we can, you know, anyway, <clears throat> anyway, I can just ramble. So I'm going to pass about the mic to Mike. Go ahead. That was great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like my big dream vision is always changing, evolving, growing, um, presenting itself. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think it's a lot about creating just easily digestible tools um, that uh, break it down in simpler terms and make some of these crops um, more approachable, but with the knowledge that you're going to need to maintain them and. and actually get your yield off of them so that's like a big one and i want to create these tools that have them there work myself out of a job eventually because it's going so well and um yeah just kind of you know keep doing that fade away someday but <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah thank you thank you both so much the the time for this session is up and thank you both so much for being part of this conversation today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us and joining. Mm -hmm.